Hello, today we are going to talk about designing data collection tools or the instruments with which we use the, the instruments that we use to collect data in health research. Generally in health research, the kind of information that we would like to collect can be basically divided into three areas. We want to know facts such as the characteristics of our study participants, the environment that they live in uh, and their behaviors or practices. Secondly, we might want to know their level of knowledge for things such as risk factors for uh, getting disease or uh, knowledge about uh, healthy lifestyles so as to prevent diseases. And thirdly and very importantly, we might want to collect information on what we call the domain of judgments, basically what are the opinions of the research participants on a certain issue, maybe such as quality of health services. Uh, we would also may, we may want to know about the respondents attitudes towards certain things. For example, could be something as wearing seat belts, uh, use of open defecation and so forth. Now, how do we collect data on all these different kinds of information that we want to collect? For this purpose, we can make use of a variety of tools uh, depending on what kind of data we would like to collect. One, we have what are called abstraction forms, which is basically uh, doing a review of records of the study participants which could be their personal records, the forms, uh, if we want to get information on their disease condition, signs and symptoms, uh, treatment given, then we could look at the clinical records. Uh, we could look at data in general, uh, the data that's collected through uh, disease surveillance. And we could also look at registers wherein some information which may be there. And all of this information can be culled out into what we want in, in the form of a data abstraction form. Secondly, another tool that we have for collecting data is a structured observation guide, which this is very useful when we would like to uh, document certain processes, whether they are happening, the way they are happening, whether they are happening in time or not, are the objectives met. And for this purpose, we may use a checklist of items that we would like to collect data on, which could be either textual or figurative. And third and most importantly, the tool that is used most commonly is a questionnaire, wherein we would like we talk to the person uh, and get information. Now again questionnaires can be divided into two kinds. It could be interviewer administered where the data collector actually uh, administers the questions to the respondents, which could be done either face to face, it could be done on the telephone. And now you even have computer assist technologies to do face-to-face uh, -face interviews. The questionnaires could also be self-administered if the study participants can read and write and they are knowledgeable enough to understand uh, what the investigators want. These could again be either paper-based or now we also have computer-assisted self-administered questionnaires uh, which uh, can help uh, the uh, respondents to directly uh, put their information into a computer database. Now, whatever uh, tool of in data collection we use, what we want is that uh, we need a valid response from the study participant. The response should make sense uh, and we should be able to use that information uh, effectively for our health research needs. In order to do that, every data collection tool needs to, be mind needs to make sure that there are some key elements uh, that uh, make up this data collection tool. Some of these elements are the clarity of words that we use in a data collection tool, the balance of phrases and sentences, the length of sentences, how long are these questions, the comprehensiveness of the responses in terms if you are giving categories of responses that you expect from the study participants. These categories can actually even pose constraints in terms of what information can, could or could not be collected through a data collection tool. Of course, the utility of the data collection tool, and especially the utility of the instructions, which I will elaborate on in uh, the next slides. The order in which the questions are asked is, very, is a very important element which can decide how your respondents 
answer your questions. And of course, the context in which you frame these questions and the question and the tools uh, are used. <clears throat> so, if we look at any data collection tool generically, it has four components. There is the introduction part at the beginning and a conclusion at the end. There are what are called identifiers. Uh, then uh, the, each question may have uh, linked instructions for the data collectors and of course, the whole body of the instruments which is basically the question items. In terms of the introduction, uh, the introduction is used to present the study to the study participants, state out the objectives and uh, probably get informed consent and so forth. It is also good to always have a concluding statement at the end of your uh, questionnaire and uh, thank the study participant for their time and effort that they have put in to uh, answer your questions. Now, every data collection tool will also have what we call identifiers, uh, which could be either the actual identifiers, the information such as the name and address of the study participant, which can uh, identify who the person is. It is always a good idea from an ethical and a human subject protection perspective to e to if you are collecting this data to, key to collect this in a separate sheet of paper and uh, which can be referred to later on if need be. On the other hand, in order to maintain confidentiality, investigators also use coded ID numbers to give identifiers to the study participants. And these ID numbers could be composite in such that they could have numbers which denote uh, say the state which the person belongs to, the district, the village uh, and then the household uh, and then the individual ID. So, it could be a mix of all these uh, numbers, all these codes and then you get a composite code looking at which you can actually identify uh, who the respondent is, but would not be able to actually get an exact identification and which is good from the confidentiality perspective. In terms of the instructions, uh, there could be general instructions uh, in for the data collectors such as prompts in terms of uh, for example, uh, do not read out all the responses, let the tick only the one that the uh, study participant uh, mentions. There could be instructions for skip patterns. Now, uh, questionnaires may have skip patterns in the sense that there may be some questions which based on the response to those, the subsequent question may not be relevant. And then there is, uh, an, uh, there is an instruction which says that you skip this from question 2, you may go to say question 19 and skip rest of the questions because they are not relevant to this study participant. It is al always a good idea to maybe use different fonts uh, so as to make, make it clear that what is the actual question and which part of the item is actually an instruction for the data collector. And then of course, we have the whole body of the instrument which is basically the question items. Now, these question items could be of various types. We could have what are called open questions, we could have closed ended questions and we could have somewhere something in the middle. So, let us see what are these different types of questions. Uh, as the name suggests, open questions are the ones where the answers are not suggested to the study participants and the respondent has to generate an answer. The good thing about these questions is it, it gives a uh, total freedom to the respondent to give the answer of what they want. They are not constrained by the categories of answers that are already existing. It helps to stimulate the memory of the research participant and gets, gives you a more uh, better answer so as to speak. Uh, and it is also useful at a hypothesis raising stage wherein we are really not sure what the appropriate answer is and it you can generate a lot of responses from the study participants. Of course, uh, when you generate a lot of responses, open questions, the inconvenience is that it may be difficult to code and analyze. You may have a long list of responses and then to categorize them later may be an issue. And sometimes the if it is open, the responses may be unfocused or incomplete and that can pose a challenge in terms of the analysis. Uh, now, to overcome this problem, we can have open questions, but then we can have them with closed ended answers. Although there is a category of answers given for the uh, for those that question, but the data collector does not suggest an answer from these categories 
to the study participant. So, when the answers are freely mentioned by the respondent, the interviewer will spontaneously tick those that are specified from the list uh, of categories of responses given in the questionnaire. So, it is expressed as an open question, but you finally analyze this as a close ended question. Now, what are closed questions? Closed questions are the ones where you have a question and you have a set category of answers only which are the ones that are acceptable to this uh, investigator. These could be two types, you could have closed questions with only two options, with dichotomous options uh, such as yes, no, male, female and so forth. Uh, so, these kind of question it forces a clear position for the respondent to take and it is very useful to get key information especially for important issues and it is which is very focused. Although sometimes uh, depending on the question it may actually oversimplify some of the issues, issues where a yes no answer is not something that is going to give you uh, a very good information. <coughs> then we have closed questions with multiple options, so more than two options. Now here they again there can be two kinds of these op, uh, closed questions with multiple options. We could have questions where although there are multiple options, only one of the option is acceptable. So, depending on what the respondent say, says, one of this option is uh, ticked by the data collector. On the other hand, we could have clo uh, closed ended questions with multiple options, wherein even multiple responses by the study participants may be acceptable. Uh, the important thing to note is that while you are designing the questionnaire, you need to put a clear instruction for the data collector whether only one answer is acceptable for this uh, question or more than one answer may be acceptable. So, we have a large choice of answer options. Uh, again depending on how the question is framed and what the actual question is, sometimes it may become inconvenient and difficult for to choose only one option if there is a possibility of more than one option, but that, uh, that possibility is not provided in the questionnaire. So, we have to be mindful of this when you are designing your questionnaires. And thirdly, we could have closed questions which have quantitative answers, where the respondent has to provide a number. Uh, such as age, uh, such as maybe how one example here if you see how many times did you visit the clinic in the last 12 months. Uh, these kind of questions uh, allows the creation of continuous variables and then measuring and doing the analysis uh, for continuous variables. If you need we can always categorize these variables later on in the time of analysis if needed. However, sometimes uh, it can become inconvenient uh, to give a quantitative answers because some quantified answers may be limited in the way they can be handled as continuous variables and where the number it itself is difficult to interpret. So, we need to be careful in how we are framing these kinds of questions. And then there we could have something called which are called semi open questions where you basically have a question with several responses. The answers here are suggested, but uh, uh, there is there may be one option where which is kept open uh, and the most common one that we see in data collection tools and questionnaires is others. So, for example, so did your child have complication following measles? Uh, it could be they could ha not have been any complication, it could be pneumonia, diarrhea, eye problems or there could be some other complications which may not be so common so as to be put in a category, but then you give an option to the respondent to even say things other than what is in the list of categories of responses. So, it leaves the door open for unplanned answers, however, if there are too many of these responses it may sometimes become difficult to analyze. So, now let us look at how some of the principles and do's and do not'ts of formulating the questions. It is always a good idea to actually have short and precise questions. Say for example, if you want to uh, know the age of your study participant, uh, just writing age is not a good idea. You should always use full and complete phrases. So, what is your age? So, avoiding ambiguities. It is a good idea to use simple words and not use very uh, complicated uh, academic language, 
use everyday language in terms of questions because again remember that your respondents are lay people. Uh, when you are formulating questions, again it is a good idea to avoid negatives, especially double negatives. So, one example that we have here is uh, do say do you sometimes care for patients without washing hands. Now, if you see carefully there are there is uh, a negative connotation here and there is uh, there are sort of two parts of the questions. One is caring for patients and the other one is washing hands or without washing hands. So, a better way to phrase this question could be to ask it directly and more positively. So, do you systematically wash hands before caring for each patient which makes it clear and unambiguous. Again when you ask a question it should be only one question at a time. Uh, say one example here that we have here. So, did you refuse treatment because you feared side effects. So, now here actually we have two questions. One is asking did you refuse treatment and the other is trying to find out the reason of why if the person refused treatment why did they do so. It may be that the, paper, the respondent may not have refused treatment then how does that respondent answer this question. So, it is a good idea to actually split such questions into two questions wherein one could be first the first part say could be did you refuse treatment depending on yes or no if the answer is yes the following question could be was this because you feared side effects which makes things very clear. Again the questions need to be specific and not vague. So, an example that we have here uh, is say you want to know from the people about how HIV is transmitted. So, uh, and the question is are you aware of the modes of transmission of HIV uh, which is sort of an open ended and uh, not it leaves uh, uh, space for people to answer whatever they may want to answer. But if you really want to know whether HIV is transmitted through sexual route, uh, through heterosexual route, homosexual route, blood transfusion, drug use etcetera, then it is better to actually put these as categories of responses and then phrase the question as among these practices can you tell me those that could expose you to HIV. So, you know that you are going to get the proper answer to the question in which you want it to have. It is also a good idea to always use a neutral tone and avoid judgmental tones or which can influence the response of the study participants. Remember that you are there as a data collector to just collect data and not uh, be judgmental of uh, what the respondent is telling you. So, uh, one example that we have here, so if you want to know about say the sexual practices uh, of people uh, instead of asking them have you been promiscuous in the last 6 months. Again the word promiscuous uh, has a negative connotation. So, instead of that it could be more neutral and more academic kind of a question wherein you just be direct and specific and ask about how many partners have you had in the last 6 months uh, without being too judgmental. Now, the next thing that you would want to do when you are designing your questionnaire is to actually sort out what would be the order of the questions that you have. Remember that the way in which you ask questions should be such as if you are having a conversation with the study participant and it should be a smooth flow uh, of questions one after the other linked to one another. So, the, some general principles to keep in mind is that always ask simple questions first and keep the complicated questions for the later part. You can ask more general questions, sociodemographic characteristics uh, uh, like that and then go on to the specific questions of what your study uh, is all about. Ask more casual questions in the beginning which the respondent will be easy to answer more of, of more of factual questions and then more intimate uh, uh, questions, question sensitive issues, ish, uh, questions about attitudes and opinions could be something that could come later on. It is always again a good idea remember uh, to actually group together all the questions which are related to the same topic of inquiry instead of having them spread across uh, different parts of the questionnaire which can actually confuse the respondent. Uh, in terms of asking the identification questions either they can all be asked at the end in terms of the name, age, gender, uh, say the address and so forth 
or A could even be asked at the end so as to uh, get get to the specifics right at the beginning. If you are trying to collect information uh, about a sequence of events, then it is you sh your questions should be in that proper chronological order of how things would have happened uh, in real time, which will actually help uh, the respondent to recall the responses uh, in a better way uh, and also in a more logical way. Again, if there, if your questionnaire is complex, there are a lot of questions, uh, it is always good to give a break in the middle and maybe have some simple questions and then come back to your complex questions. Many a times we may ask the same kind of question in different ways in the same questionnaire uh, and then that is used if you are real if that is the subject matter that is really important for the study and you really want to know uh, that the respond what the respondent is telling you uh, makes sense is valid is true. And then so the multiple questions on the same topic could be asked at different places in the questionnaire and then when you are trying to analyze it you can triangulate these responses to get to what uh, information you would like to extract from these questions. Once you have sorted out the order, now what is needed is to actually lay out all these questions in the questionnaire. Again remember uh, it is uh, laying out the format, the structure of the questionnaire is again critical because uh, the way uh, the respondents look at the questionnaire, the design and the look of the questionnaire uh, influences or can influence the response uh, of the participants. So, if you have different sections in the questionnaire, it is a good idea to split the sections, uh, have one section have maybe have uh, a line and then have the next section. Uh, do not try to cram questions all together, have spaces uh, between the questions so that it is readable clearly. Uh, try to use large fonts, uh, not too small fonts, so maybe a font size of 11 not 12. Uh, would be ideal. Uh, again, do not split questions across pages. If you have, if you have a question, and then if it half of it goes to the next page, it becomes difficult for the data collector to actually read the question. You'll have to turn the page and so forth. So, if that's happening, may make sure that you sort of uh, bring the whole question on one page. <coughs> In terms of formatting and aligning. Uh, alignments are again gives you a nice neat look for the questionnaire. So, it is a good idea to actually align your questions on the left hand side and your answers and codes on the right hand side, which gives a neat two column kind of a look uh, to your questionnaire, uh, which makes it more appealing. Do not forget to number your questions uh, starting from 1 to whatever that you have. Again, one very uh, important thing to keep in mind is coding. Uh, remember that ultimately what you are going to do is use this data and to enter it into a software, give it codes to analyze it. So, it is always a good idea to actually have a coding system inbuilt in the questionnaire itself. So, you need to standardize your coding. So, wherever say for uh, the simplest example I could give you is a yes no. So, you could have a code of 1 for yes and a 0 for no for example. Make sure that every question, every response where you have yes, no you have coded it as 1, 0. Say you have male, female. So, you always code the male maybe as 1 and the female as 2 or something like that. Uh, another way uh, to actually uh, simplify this coding is to use what we call as auto coding. So, the numbers that you give to the category say you have uh, 4 response categories. So, you would number them 1, 2, 3, 4 and when if say the response is number 2, then you use the same number 2 as a code for this question item. So, this these are some of the ways in which you make sure that your the layout of your questionnaire uh, is neat and is presentable and it is something that helps both the data collector as well as uh, the data entry operator and the person who is going to enter and analyze the data at the later stage. When you are finalizing your data collection tool, make sure that uh, the questions that you have are some things that are that is relevant to the study that you are doing. So, as may, may have been mentioned in earlier sessions, 
the investigator needs to be a slave of the study objectives and what the analysis, the analysis that is already pre-planned for the study. So make sure that the questions that you have are relevant for this to answer those study objectives. Do not put unnecessary questions just because you are going out in the field and doing a study does not mean that you can ask anything and everything. And if you feel that there are certain missing questions, make sure to add them. Once you have done all this, it is also a good practice to actually review your instrument before you take it to the field. Now, the reviews could be done by your colleagues and experts in the field. Uh, you could also give it to the statisticians to actually review, look at the codings, whether that is going to be something that is going to be useful for them. And uh, then you could even uh, the field workers or the data collectors who are going to actually collect the data, uh, they are, they can be uh, your key informants to actually go through the questionnaire and tell you whether the flow is appropriate, whether the questions make sense, is there any ambiguity or is there something that is not understood and so forth. Keep in mind that the language of the instrument, the questionnaire or the data abstraction form or so forth uh, has to be in the language in which the you are going to interview the study participants. So, uh, if you if your study participants speak Tamil, uh, then the questionnaire should be in Tamil. If it is Hindi, it should be in Hindi. Uh, generally as uh, investigators, uh, English is the common language. So, we may be your initial formulation of the questionnaire would be in English. Then what you need is a translation. You need to translate it into the local language and then very importantly have somebody else do a back translation into English. So, as to make sure that the translated version in the local language makes the same sense as you wanted it to be uh, and when you frame those questions in English. Before going to the field, it is always important to pilot test your tools. You need to make sure that your study instrument is clear, the questions that you have asked are understandable to the people and they are acceptable. People are not wary of answering those questions. You need to check the flow and the skip patterns, make sure that the coding works and also it also gives you a sense of how much time it is going to take for you to actually finish the questionnaire. All this can be done by doing a, a pilot testing by actually administering this questionnaire to a few volunteers in the which are who are similar to the study population that you are going to do. But remember that these people on which you pilot test your questionnaire should not be included later on in the main study. So, when we are designing the health research tools, we need to keep certain principles in mind. You need to first make sure what is it that you want to measure. Remember epidemiology is all about measuring. Then you relate need to relate these concepts to your study designs and the study objectives. You need to match the scales how you are going to measure these to and then how you are going to do the analysis. <coughs> Make sure that the scales, the questions, the questionnaires, the data collection tools that you are using are reliable and valid for the population that you are going to apply them to. Taking all these things in mind, choose the most appropriate method of data collection, uh, whether it is a data abstraction form or a structured observation guide or a questionnaire uh, and the type of questions that you are going to uh, put in these data collection instruments. Keep in mind your study participants uh, in terms of the language of uh, the questionnaire and also the way in which you are trying to measure the concepts that you are doing and then decide finally how best you are going to ask the actual question in the study questionnaire. <clears throat> Remember a study questionnaire can make or break the study. This is something, uh, this is once you have collected data, you, you may not have the opportunity to go back. So it is essential that the data that you collect is valid and reliable and in order to do that, it is key that the data, co uh, data collection instruments that you develop are some things uh, are totally valid and appropriate to the study that you are trying to conduct. That is it for today. Thank you.